Hello. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Welcome to this cool winter afternoon. And once again, we are meeting in this space of La Model. In this case, around this International Day of the Holocaust Remembrance, which is tomorrow, the 27th of January. And it also has the origin at the liberation of the Auschwitz camp. And this year, within the spaces, cultural centers, municipality of Barcelona, memory, etc., Marta Mani, welcome, director of the Born, who is also uh, presenting things around this thing, and now as a commissioner of some exhibitions around this subject, and among other things, among other conferences, and also a translator of uh, concentration literature. That's something very important. And today, we are very honored to introduce three people. And this year, we have thought about the dialogue more than a conference and working session. And this dialogue will be around the subject of uh, street art and artistic representation of memory. And we have Brett Glickman, Glickman with us. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. And, and thank you very much for the Eurom uh, team for this invitation. I'm really happy, I'm very uh, excited to be here. Uh, also, I've heard a lot about this place, about the space, and, and um, it's very unique, and I'm really glad to uh, be here. Uh, yeah, we should be here. <laughs> 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 Even I will see the presentation is speed uh, back for it. Okay, so street art and Holocaust remembrance. Um, I will start with a presentation of the topic, and only then uh, I will say some things about the project. Uh, and I think that that would also call for uh, more discussion later. So, when, let me start with a more general uh, question. Visual art representing the Holocaust? I was there. I was there. I testify. Genocide is not art. These were the words of an 81 years old uh, survivor of Buchenwald. And he was protesting in front of the New York, uh, the Jewish um, Museum in New York, which then hosted an exhibition by the name Mirroring Evil, Nazi imagery, recent art. He was protesting because the work of art there were um, somewhat provocative, uh, controversial, and, can you, and, and uh, it really raised the question that was actually uh, there for, for a long time. Can art represent the unrepresentable? Can we talk about what? you cannot really talk about. And if so, what are the boundaries? So as you can see, uh, the artist, he was a young guy, and in the interview he said that he doesn't know much about the Holocaust, but he photoshopped himself uh, as one of the prisoners in Buchenwald, and with a, a can of Coke and said the real thing, and God knows. So you can understand why that was a bit, uh, uncomfortable for the Holocaust survivors. So if we have a question about visual art in general, what about street art? We're talking about a mode of art which was actually originated in um, defiant graffiti, in guerrilla art, even vandalism. Would such art be responsible enough um, would be serious enough to present the Holocaust. Could we ask the street artists, the majority of which are still prefer to remain anonymous, to uh, offer their work of art in uh, the, this cause of remembrance of the Holocaust um, and raise historical awareness? Um, can we ask the street artists, would they be willing to take part in what is called activism, art and activism? 
and actually engage and encourage people to be engaged uh, against, against any kind of manifestation of neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic, uh, or anti-liberal uh, ideology. So the answer uh, is yes, actually, big yes. Um, when you just look, I, I did a really a very short research. Uh, I couldn't find any kind of uh, academic research about the topic of Holocaust and, and street art representation. But if you look around, I could find at least 10 artists, uh, all of them coming from different countries. I'm talking about Germany, uh, Ita Italy, Spain, uh, Poland, Austria, Croatia, even the United States. And they're also coming with a different uh, personal uh, background, uh, artistic background. They are using different techniques, artistic techniques, and they are working in a different uh, cultural context. But they all do, as I'm going to show you, an amazing uh, work, uh, an amazing art dedicated to uh, memory of the Holocaust. And the first, uh, oh, okay, <laughs> and what, no, 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 please, yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, and if you look, if, if you kind of uh, uh, survey the, um, the works of art, what you can see is there is kind of three things that uh, street artists are focusing. They are either responding or they are representing, documenting and representing mainly uh, uh, victims of the Holocaust. Or they are also reflecting, they are asking what can be done. Uh, so this kind of thing won't, won't come back, won't be back again. And the first artist I want to um, show you is Ibo Omari. He's, uh, he's the one who is really responding to uh, neo-Nazi graffiti in his neighborhood. He uh, was appalled by the number of swastika graffiti. And uh, he has a graffiti shop, and uh, he's also running a youth club. So what he did, he invited his fellow artists and the youth and they not just, they didn't cover the swastika, they painted on it. They painted nice, positive things on the swastika. And I would like to show you, and he, yeah, that was what he said. It was uh, important to spur young people into action and to encourage them to take responsibility. So they don't just ignorantly walk past such symbols of hatred. And there's, now, a short one minute video which I want to show you because uh, it uh, illustrates what they did. I just had the idea of drawing a head around it. Here it's a house, for example, and here it's a billiard ball that's running away. As you can see, it helped. There were less plastica once this project started, and they did it in other cities as well. So it's a really uh, great project. Another artist who also responded to, again, swastika uh, was Vered Dro. Uh, she's an Israeli, uh, and she took part in a festival in Zagreb. And she was walking by the street, and she was also noticed a lot of swastika on her. So she was asking her fellow artist, have you seen that? And nobody said that they saw it. They didn't see it. So she decided she will create a braille graffiti. 
you know, for uh, the people who can see. And she wrote in Braille, so in Serbo, in Serbo Croatian Braille, uh, the uh, text, this text. Have you, oh sorry, <laughs> can you go back? Have you seen the swastika? I haven't seen a thing. Uh, that was what was scripted in Braille. And then, so that was one example and another one. Okay. Akut is uh, another uh, street artist who, in a way, he was also responding. Uh, Akut was collaborating with another, um, uh, with another uh, um, a film uh, artist. He was a filmmaker, and he interviewed 400 uh, survivors and took photos of them. And he created an exhibition out of it with their uh, portrait in a really big scale, eyes glazing, uh, looking at, uh, at you. And this was a traveling exhibition. It went to different places around the world. When it was in Vienna, there was vandalism. Some people, neo-Nazi or whatever, um, torn and kind of slashed the uh, Molinos. So the people in Vienna decided to defend the exhibition. And Akut um, was very, very impressed. Akut is uh, um, a, an American street artist. He was uh, from Brooklyn, if I'm not mistaken. He was very impressed. And he um, created, decided to create a mural. Uh, he chose only two. Um, um, people. He chose a male uh, who was first generation, he was in the Holocaust, and a woman who was second generation, traumatized by what her parents had to suffer. And um, if you can go, yeah, uh, you can also see that he was also portraying at the bottom the people defending, the post, those people from Vienna who were defending uh, the exhibition. What you can also see is that he put uh, on the big portrait uh, of the survivors um, quotation from the interview. There is also a QR code every time that people can learn more about them. And he also emphasized the fact that he wanted to do it in a colorful, shiny uh, colors. So that would be the message, not black and white, but with colors. Another uh, artist um, who also kind of uh, wanted to commemorate the uh, memory of the victims was Iris Andraschek. Um, sorry, Ander, Andraschek. Andraschek. Um, Iris is a Viennese, she's Austrian street artist. And uh, what she did was uh, based on a research of 100 uh, Jewish women in Krems. Krems is the small town in, uh, in Austria. And uh, these women, actually nobody really know anything about. They were all victims. Uh, they were deport deported or, or murdered. Uh, she decided to create a, a carpets uh, and dedicate each carpet to one of these women. And she stenciled this, this, this glued the stencil uh, carpet on the pavement of Krems. And um, she said that the carpets strip these women of their anonymity. If they were anonymous with me, now they are not anonymous. Uh, connecting them to history and give them back their place, at least for a period of time. I, I spoke with Iris, I uh, asked her why carpets, and she said, well, carpet for me, it's home. And that was kind of the message. She wants them to give their home again. Um, she didn't dec documented what she did, but she said that it was also very interesting to hear the responses of the people that walked by when she was gluing the, the carpet. Not of them happy with it, but some were very uh, moved by that. And that's one example of the carpet. Lacuna 
is um, he's one of the artists who is not identifying by his name. Uh, he has this interesting story. He's also German. When, as a child, he read a book uh, about the Yellow Star, and he was very um, kind of Im uh, impressed. And, and when he started doing graffiti and, and street art, uh, he was actually focusing on this period of, of time, of the uh, uh, before and after the Second World War. And as you can see, uh, one of his works uh, in, the, in Düsseldorf, uh, he actually copied um, a photo of deportation, but he changed the color of the yellow star into red. Um, he said, and that's actually quite interesting, he said, I don't want, he didn't want to continue working with graffiti because graffiti needs a bit of knowledge. You need to understand the iconography or something of what is in the graffiti. And he wanted the message to be very clear. Uh, it is my intention that the image and the text are clear so that people would understand them. So it's very, for them he needs the picture to be very, very simple and understandable. Another project by Lacuna is uh, uh, commemorating a memory of a child, Lenny Val, that in the place where she was living, um, there is an irony, it's a very sad story. Uh, her parents sent her to Amsterdam so she would be safe. But at the end, she was the one who caught, together with her family, uh, aunt and, 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 and murdered. She wasn't even 10 years old and her parents survived. So what Lacuna did is um, painted a mural of the whole family, but she's only as a shadow. And then he painted it again, fully detailed, in, where the, in the places where she lived. So this is also another work who is very much connected, the way that Iris is, to the place where uh, the victim lived. So that's how she is only a silhouette, and that's uh, an eval uh, with a white flower. Yeah. And here is the project that you are all, uh, I hope, familiar with. Uh, that was the project that was done by uh, the by Durham and uh, by Rock, uh, with uh, a collaboration with students, which I find very interesting. Also, um, I just I, I'm not going to tell a lot about that. I guess you know it, but I think it's interesting also because it's kind of um, engage in a dialogue with other forms of art who commemorate the uh, Holocaust, um, namely the uh, mouse of uh, Spiegelman, of Spiegelman. And, um, and also it uh, gives place to commemoration of uh, Catalan um, fighters for freedom that maybe were not uh, documented or, or got a place before. And um, the creation is inspired by a graphic novel Mouse, a model reference in art as a way to take back the historical and collective memory. It's by work. That's the work of two Israeli street artists. They are a couple. They are even considered as a power couple in the street art scene in Israel. Um, what Nitzan is usually doing is she paints poems on walls and Dede, her um, partner, is uh, doing mainly band-aid uh, graffiti. That's how he's recognized. With band-aid is plaster, or whatever you put on, on, on hills. Um, they were invited to lodge to the um, uh, old ghetto, Jewish ghetto of Lodge. And uh, Nitzan uh, painted a poem in Hebrew and in Polish, talking about longing to a place that you don't have anymore. And Dede was creating, um, eh, sorry, Lodge, and the other place was Ostro, um, an old Jewish synagogue in Ostro. And Dede was doing, uh, in the same places, um, a a mural, I don't know if it's a mural, it's, a, it's, a, it's an art uh, work uh, made of um, 
leftovers of furniture or something like that. But it's, it's a bird. Uh, and the idea was that on one hand, yes, there are only leftovers of the furniture, but the birds are migrating birds. And for Israelis, they kind of represent spring, or not only for Israelis. So there is this mixed mes message in that. That's the work of Dede. And another, now we are in Italy, uh, that's an Italian artist, uh, quite famous uh, Italian artist who is uh, famous also by his um, hyper-realistic uh, work and he's also a very activist uh, artist. He did two uh, murals, uh, all of them were part of uh, uh, the Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, one is painting the uh, portrait of Anne Frank on the train, the deportation train in Auschwitz. And the other, uh, was also have like a significance in terms of uh, uh, place, it's in Froli. And this is a place where the fascist, the Italian fascist, uh, murdered, I think, 400 Jews in the very last days of the war. Uh, and what he did is uh, created this mural of the prisoner cloth. Um, and now there are two more artists which I would like to show you. Uh, both are not, I mean, there is street artists which is not only about Jewish victims, but also about uh, homosexual victims uh, of the Holocaust. Uh, Nils Westergaard uh, created um, also in Berlin uh, a mural which was of uh, Walter uh, Degen. And uh, Walter Degen was a homosexual. He was imprisoned and was also a victim of the Holocaust because of his homosexuality. Uh, this, uh, okay, this, um, yeah. If you can see, that was, that was the second work that was actually kind of covering or integrating with a former work by uh, another artist. And what she did uh, was creating a triangle of pink um, origami metal. And the pink triangle is what, I don't know if you know, but that uh, every uh, prisoner uh, in the concentration camp had a different color of triangle to use. So Jews, homosexuals, Roma. Um, so she created this kind of pink uh, triangle. And the, um, the portrait of uh, um, Walter Deckel uh, was creating, yeah, OK. And the last, the last artist I want to uh, show you here, to share with you, uh, is Ski. He's also um, uh, an, a street artist from New York. Uh, what he did uh, was part of a project of uh, Artists for Israel. And they wanted to bring uh, the non-awareness of the righteous of the living. Uh, people who actually rescued and help risking their own life. And uh, this guy is, um, was a Catholic priest. Uh, and he saved the life of 3,000 3, uh, Jews. And um, he, that was uh, for his uh, memory. Um, as you can see, the style is a bit like pop art. Uh, again, very colorful uh, colors. And the, the words of uh, Alan Dershowitz, uh, which I was also, quite, by the way, in contact with, and he would be very happy to do any kind of uh, URL um, in Budapest and elsewhere. We wanted to create heroes within countries and societies and communities and say, this is what standing up to hate and fascism looks like. So. Uh, In conclusion, yes, street art can definitely represent Holocaust in a very beautiful and serious way. But I want to say even something which is even more strong. I want to say that street art may be even better in a way, more effective than 
art in gallery while talking about representation of art. Why? A, because street art is very accessible. You don't have to buy a ticket uh, to enter the museum. You don't have to plan a visit to museum. It's there and it's like part of our life. So it's really accessible, more accessible than art in galleries. And it's also kind of inviting uh, people to be engaged with, uh, with the act of art of painting. So if, the, if someone is um, painting a mural and pe people pass by, can actually enter in a dia dialogue or a comment or maybe take part of it. So it's, it's more, uh, um, it's, uh, it's not like a, a work uh, hanged in, in, a, in a wall in a gallery. It's something that people can see how it was, it's done. And the other thing which I really said, I mean, I, I mentioned this when I uh, showed you Lacuna, but I think it's really, really important. It's also like, it's very straightforward. Uh, all these works. It's very clear, it's very, and the message is very clear. And it's important. You don't have to be art savvy, or you don't have to have an education in art to understand it. And that's good, because the message is really uh, going through uh, in a very uh, good way. And street art can also relate directly to the place uh, when things happened. So in a way, it's more powerful, more effective. Um, as you see, several of the, art, the, the works that I showed you were related to the place where the victims lived, um, or, or did stuff, yeah. So, and now I'm coming to the uh, part of the project. As uh, uh, Jordi said, uh, we had this idea a year ago, perhaps even more than a year, and uh, yeah, and we had uh, an art place turn into a center for uh, Ukraine refugee. Um, so it was not really feasible to go on with this uh, project. And, uh, but since then, um, I was asking also direct the director of the Jewish Museum in Budapest, and she's very happy to collaborate. So there is actually a real uh, um, possibility that we will make it, maybe not for, uh, maybe for the next um, me Memorial Day. Um, so what I suggest, what, my, what is in my kind of uh, pool of ideas, um, but you're more than welcome to comment and, and, and add to this, um, is first of all to bring together all this interesting work and just also to bring to kind of a discussion the role of street art in Holocaust uh, remembrance. And um, there is also an idea which I like. One of my friends suggested that maybe we can screen the works on the walls of the uh, former uh, ghetto uh, in Budapest could be really interesting to do it. It can be done every night. It can be done as one event. Um, but it might be very um, impressive, I think, to do that. Um, we can also invite, you know, a work. I mean, I just told that Israelis for us, or artists for Israel would be happy to um, come up with a mural. There can be also invitation for murals. And um, workshops. I would love to have Ibo Omari <laughs> um, actually working with the, with the youth people on how to change uh, swastika into a more positive thing. Uh, or it can be any other workshop. Um, and of course, gallery talks, gallery tools, street art tools, and whatever. And this is the, uh, so this is what I have in my. Um, uh, ideas uh, pool, and I'm really kind of welcoming you um, to first to comment and maybe come up with uh, more ideas, different ideas, um, and and really thank you very much again for the invitation, um, and give okay, away. Thank Okay, so thank you very much, Beret. It's been a pleasure listening to you. 
And it's also a great pleasure to see such a full room. And I think that with different motivations. And therefore, I think that now, during the second part of the session, we can leave a couple of minutes. So we give the floor to the audience. It will be very convenient. I think that your talk has been very motivating. You have opened many points. It has been a pleasure to see different international artists from many different countries practicing in public spaces, activists, graffiti, and also beyond graffiti with languages, murals, interdisciplinary. And to start the dialogue, I would like to say, and this will have a very, well, she was just thanking you and saying that we're going to have a spontaneous dialogue. And therefore, I'm going to ask different questions, and questions will be asked, and we will speak among us. But the first idea that I would like to present is this solid artist of uh, art and Holocaust. It's like a dichotomy, conceptual dichotomy, because as Vedet was saying, this complex introduction of how to introduce around something very dramatic, the idea of the Holocaust and the idea of the 20th century and the drama of World War II, etc., etc., to which point, and in fact, during the second part of the 20th century, we have been questioning right, how to represent this historical event, which is very complex, difficult, and dramatic. And therefore, to put such a solid title, Art and Holocaust, is quite active and quite activist, the title of your presentation. So in this sense, I would like to start by asking about the strength of art. Art has many capacities, the widest capacities as a language in order to introduce things that maybe can become controversial and to reach the limits of what can be represented. And within these limits, maybe, to think about how to go beyond that. In this sense, we would like to bet in favor of this language, strong language of visual art, and art within the public space, in the street, in the cities, through activism, or maybe other methods. And maybe to ask you a first question to the members of the round table. And the first question would be, what are the problems of working with a language which pretends the absolute freedom of language and creation with something that is so controversial, such as controlling and limiting? I, I hope I have explained myself, she says. Um, how, when we see censorship and self-censorship, when we see things that maybe have to be dealt in a very specific way. In all the fields of art, art reaches the limit of what we can say and we cannot say. Such a politically correct society in which we live. And this is affecting something very sensible, limited. And from a conceptual point of view, a representative and formally point of view, such as the Holocaust. I hope I have explained myself, <laughs> but she would like to know your opinion about it. Yes, can you hear me? OK. That's a big question, a very general question. I think I can respond from my point of view. And how do I feel it? I think that art, as such, has a huge potential. And it's a tremendous weapon. It has many ways, and it can touch many sensible points. And I think that art can be uh, triggering uh, in order for things to happen, to place things on the table, things that sometimes are approached from uh, technicism and rigor, uh, from the awareness of people. And I understand that one strategy could be to push ourselves to the limits. And I think this is part of art in general to play always with these limits, 
and test. But personally, and it's not to sabotage your question, I'm more interested in all the other artistic lines that don't look for this controversy in order to place problems on the table. But I think it's more interesting to explore, for example, art as a tool to share awareness problems, which are uh, community problems shared by the members of community, and in a way to call upon people more than, well, I don't know. I think that it's a very complex debate. And in the end, when Beret was showing us the different artists that she has reflected here, I really like and I felt very identified with, I think, Lacuna, who was speaking about images which I interpret very figurative, very representative of uh, reality. Reproducing this reality as an element uh, to reflect on a reality, to remember the reality, and to keep it within the public space. I hope my answer is not ambiguous as the question. <laughs> well, there are no correct answers. Thank you, Rock. Beret. I don't know if you can say something. Uh, yeah, I completely agree that this is a very, very difficult <laughs> question to answer. Um, what I, first of all, I would like just to echo what you said, uh, if I understood, <laughs> uh, is that art can be very, very uh, powerful because it has a, this kind of immediacy, uh, which it's unlike uh, poetry or, or prose or uh, you, and it's, it's very clear, you don't have to know a lot to understand. <laughs> and also, you can have your own interpretation. It's like not, it's, it's even maybe more open for that, maybe. Um, on the other hand, um, I do think that artists needs to be responsible in a way when they are touching. What, what, what the example that I just showed of this uh, artist who photoshopped himself, on interview, he said, that, oh, he's young, he doesn't know much about the Holocaust. He was making a point without really being um, you know, fully immersed or, or do the, the homework, understanding what you are doing. So, and that's, that's crossing the limits. I'm, I'm, I don't think, I think that the art should, shouldn't be, I mean, freedom of art should be kept, of course. But um, you need to be an adult. Uh, and, and if you want to explore, do it, but do your homework as well. Do, understand what you are dealing with uh, and, and maybe do it in a dialogue or in a kind of a communication. So um, I don't think that there should be any kind of pre-made restrictions or what can or cannot be done or as, as art. But I do think that um, you, use, you can use, it's a, it's a tool that you use, and you, you need to use it in a responsible way and be sensitive um, to uh, those who went through something which you can't really <laughs> even start imagining. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my, uh, mm. my response. Um, continue. Let me continue with another subject which is related to what you said before. There are a couple of things that come from your comments which bring other subjects. I can bring them together so we can open it more. The first one will be this aspect that has appeared in the different um, speeches that you have pronounced. And Bennett, you were saying that street art is direct, it's efficient, is direct and efficient, and it uses uh, brutally efficient languages, doesn't need any intermediaries, and it's based on action. This is very powerful. 
also the capacity to interpret the work of art through the action by acting uh, in the work of art. And then this subject, which is so intense, which is the capacity to relate the content, the image, the formal element with the place, the territory where it all happened, where history happened. So it is obvious that this eloquence of art and the city with a clear image through art and also through the visual element, I think it has a huge capacity. So thank you very much for bringing so many images and artists reflecting these discourses from many different points of view. But everybody has its own imaginaries and one of mine the ones I, the one I go back, are the German counter monuments of those artists of the conceptual Josengel. These people who, in the 80s and 90s, approach conceptual art, more subtle conceptual art, not abstract but conceptual to the territory, to the public space, and for me they are reference, which are classics. And of course, we could say, we could label them as elitist because they are much more difficult. Well, I don't know if they are much more difficult, but uh, they use languages which are, may, which are based on the invisibility, silence, conceptual languages, which are not so direct. What I would like to know is, well, I don't know, if uh, it's, it's not I prefer this to the other, but how do you leave this dichotomy between intellectualism and more direct languages? And whether this conceptual art that I think is worth taking into account can or has helped us to have a more powerful street art? Or what are the links between both territories, if there are any links? Okay, so I can answer first. All the questions that you are asking could give way to a whole conference, a symposium. I think that uh, street art has many potentialities, as we said before, art in the street. But let me say more what it claims is that art belongs to the street. And is not that we take the galleries to the street, but the galleries are there, but art is part of our lives, has to be part of our lives and the communities. This is the basic uh, basis. It's not that uh, art is out of the galleries, but sometimes uh, art is taken into the gallery and becomes a trade commodity, but art has to be part of our lives and has to be a tool for communication and social dialogue. When we saw the interventions of uh, Ivo, uh, for example, I understand that the actions that he's performing, shown by Beret, we are saying that if you visit the city, and what you see when you walk around the streets are swastikas or racist paintings. You have a clear idea of which society is welcoming you or refusing you. So we're not talking about art. We are uh, talking about the hegemony and a society which is active and takes the street and tries to fight against it and to win the public space, to win back the public space as a space full of values tolerance and against this type of attitudes. Therefore, we are speaking about the political action where the artistic fat in itself is second line. And when I think that all questions are very intense or questions that you are asking because this is space between what is conceptual, I think that it's a endless debate. In fact, I question myself uh, often if I'm an artist or just a communicator, because I think that art, it's an intellectual exercise, almost philosophic, uh, passionate, but it often requires um, understanding several tools and the necessary codes to be able to interpret it. Because when we go into the street, 
we have to place it within reach of uh, people. And we need the space in order for this to happen when the objective is to claim several values or to remember at least different episodes about uh, memory relating it to all this. And I think that the cities, as we were saying before, give us an idea uh, of what they are uh, by looking at the flaneur walking around the streets, taking a look at the different collectives, organizations, entities. All this makes us understand a city and a space. And therefore, I think that this is the ideal space. And art is the ideal tool. So this city not only speaks about this present activism and values of society, but it also reminds us which is the memory and the history of public spaces, because I think that the cities, in a way, are like human bodies. All these subjects are uncomfortable, sensible, full of pain, uh, injuries inflicted to humanity. I think that uh, injuries leave scars, and if you heal them, you have to claim them and be part of the dignity of the survivors. And I think that art and the public space allow us to show these scars instead of another trend and uh, a project a space like La Model. It's a good place to speak about this because these scars have to be shown in order for them to be the tools that allow us to understand the weight that we are carrying as societies. Uh, not something that has to be erased and replaced by something else on painful episodes. I don't mean to stay stagnated in the past, but to have a future which is not grey. <coughs> um, okay, uh Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry for all these technical things. Um, well, there were two things that came to my mind uh, when you, and, and uh, I'm very associative now. Uh, one was that um, I'm very fond of um, um, conceptual art. <laughs> and I have to admit that whenever I go into a gallery or a museum, I, I, I have no problem understanding, of course, if I have the background. Um, some of my favorite Israeli artists or conceptualists, and it even helps me, help me, really, uh, helps me to, to, that there is a bit of text or, or kind of to grasp the idea. So, but I don't, what I meant is that um, um, it's, what about, it's street art, it's, it's not like this elite art, like we are a very uh, close uh, circle of artists who would understand um, only each other and we speak our language and, uh, and look about, you know, from, uh, from afar, from uh, atop on, on, so, and, what I'm saying is that street art, in a way, uh, is, as is, is, uh, said, is like is among us. So it actually it, it communicates uh, with the viewer, and it it wants to communicate with the viewer. So I, as as I understand, maybe not. Maybe some of it uh, there is a graffiti with just a protest of anger or anything, and doesn't want to say anything apart from a very personal thing. But there are street arts which are not, that's not like that. So, um, so I'm not afraid of any conceptual, conceptual, or it can be, it can be more, um, um, I don't know, complicated or something, even on the street. Um, but not as a kind of, uh, in a, in a, it is a closed circle, okay? So it's only, I mean, if you haven't finished second degree in, in, in art studies, then you don't really understand what's going on. That, that was what I meant. Um, 
The other thing, uh, and I'm really, really, really associated with here, uh, I was yesterday in uh, this, the, your museum of um, the, the Catalonia, the National uh, Museum of Catalonia, and, and there is a wonderful Romanesque rooms there. And there's a lot of kind of, I thought it's kind of a street art, not really street art, uh, but it's art on walls. And, um, and when you think of it, there were times when people, there was a lot of, art on walls in churches, for instance, that's actually meant to be telling a story. Um, and they were also supposed to be quite simple. Um, I, I, at least people understood. They knew the, the, the language. They could decipher what they see. Um, so yeah, and that was part of their life. Uh, they didn't have to, I mean, it's not really part of their life. They didn't buy a, a ticket to go to the um, church. Um, so that's, that's what I meant, like uh, being this kind of immediate uh, and accessible and more close to what, to what everybody is, <laughs> or again, not just being, uh, um, yeah, not for these kind of um, articles in academic magazines. Okay. okay. I was thinking, I was thinking that you have spoke about the concept of interpretation, the public space, the legitimacy. I think it's a very powerful concept, and I agree with this idea, um, what you were saying about this capacity of uh, street art to be evocative, direct, and natural. The natural place is the public space. And I agree with it. The natural place of art doesn't have to be the museum or a gallery. It's a later construct. If we go back to this context, and maybe uh, we would like to listen to the audience as well, but if we go back to this place where we are, which is the public space, a space where anything can happen, a strike or a manifestation, a party, uh, giants, <laughs> etc. So spaces of leisure and conflict, sometimes at different moments of the day, we have this concept that has been repeated, which is the concept of interpretation and how the citizen and the people that live in these spaces uh, interpret the works of art. How this braille, for example, is powerful in this sense, because uh, through the language of uh, invisibility, it's talking about something that happens to everybody. We are all blind in the public space, and we stop seeing swastikas when it's full of swastikas. Therefore, if we place ourselves in the people who interpret, whether they know art or not, uh, how or what is your experience, and how I would like to know, because I was thinking that in the mural that we did with rock, in the Plaza del Rey, it was very interesting because the action was developed in Saito in the public space, and several things happened there. And let me tell you very briefly, but this mural and object was exhibited in two different places. In an exhibition space of the MUBA and the University of Barcelona. So I would like to ask you, because this is something that you have introduced into your project, how to introduce an element which is foreigner, external to the museum, within the museum, and how can I explain from the museum what has happened outside? You have already explained it, but let me ask you about uh, which will be the different artifacts, conceptual artifacts, or the narratives in order to explain what you want to say. And the question that I wanted to ask is if you will introduce what you were saying at the beginning, the limits of representation. Can we speak about the Holocaust and within the museum? Can it happen? Or is this something the, that you will explain? Talking about the context and the limits of representation related to the Holocaust. 
but it's also related to the interpretation, the way we interpret the works of art. And let me tell you about the anecdote that happened to Rock when he was painting the mural. There was a group of tourists coming from Israel, and it was fantastic because we were able to explain that we were making a mural commemorating the victims of the Holocaust with some names of people who were fatal victims of the Holocaust in the Nazi camps, exiliated from the Spanish Civil War. And the answer was very harsh, and it was difficult to understand. Remember Rock. They claim that they were claiming the memory of the victims, of the people in exile, but they were not claiming the memory of the Jewish, which of course was the human body, which was more intensely victimized. Although that symbolically, there were those elements that we had to have in our opinion. But this is an example. I don't want to dwell into this, but this capacity of interpretation which has some consequences as well, which are quite interesting, especially in the public space, where everybody is free to understand grossly what is happening there without what happens in the museum. Some writings explaining you the message. I know this question is very wide but the interpretation and the link between public space and museum, and whether there are filters or not. I'll try to summarize, because we're running out of time. About the interpretation, I would like to think that the works of art and the interventions that we carry out do not finish when we, the artists, finish these works of art, but it's completed by the visitors um, when they are touched by the work of art and the reading. So this is a process or a permanent construction. And in fact, I've always had the need to direct my message by adding quotes or by writing a literal message. Um, although it has not been a problem, and thinking that I was making very clear which was the message that I wanted to transmit. So I have received several feedbacks on this work of art, contributing with different points of view, which are much more interesting and help me to reflect on my work of art. And this is part of the process. We don't speak about empirical data, but when we are touched, and therefore, I think that this is one of the strong points of art. And about this anecdote that you have just explained, I would like to contextualize it because it was uh, a strange situation. Um, conditions did not happen in order to have a debate about why are we speaking about this. I think it's important to claim it because what we were doing was to work with young people, teenagers from high schools, and we thought it was very important in a way. As an artist, I relate to the work of art. You establish like a link when you make a creation, when you work at it. Uh, it can sound very topical, but in a way it's part of you. And I think that when you place young people to do these things, uh, they are related to the message they are given. And I think that it makes them have a different prism and they establish a different link with the victims of the Holocaust. And when we introduced this project and we understood that the Spanish Civil War is the war of Spain. And it's like the introduction to the Second World War, and all is part of uh, the same. And I thought it was very important that these young people, um, when we talk about deported people, they should write Catalan names or Spanish names, could be their grandparents, in order for them to understand that it was calling upon them. It was not something fictional. 
it was not something far away, but something that was part of uh, its own history. And therefore, in this sense, each one of the projects can be approached from many different points, far from uh, not feeling sorry for the pain of the Jewish people. I just wanted to give the student the possibility to connect in a more direct way with that episode. Yeah, okay. I don't know if you noticed, but there was one place uh, which I didn't find um, street art related to Holocaust, and it's not a place where there is no street art. And that's actually Tel Aviv or Israel. Um, Israeli artists did participate in, in projects, but in Europe, not in Israel. And it kind of make me think why? Why can't I find um, a Holocaust-related street art in, 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 in Israel? Um, there might be like, the, first of all, um, it's not also related to the fact that street art is kind of connected to the place and things happened in Europe and not in, in but we've seen street art in, in many places, so why not in Tel Aviv? Maybe it's, and is it because of the sensitivity? Is it because they are afraid, um, maybe artists are afraid to touch the subject, uh, although they are not afraid to touch any kind of subject, um, including occupation and everything, any kind of subject. But I couldn't find any street art related to Holocaust in Israel. I'll, I'll still look for it, but I, I haven't found it. Um, that might be one of the reasons, because they are kind of keeping their boundaries and they, are, like, and, and they don't want to do something too provocative on one hand. And at the other end, um, they don't need these very simple images, because as an Israeli, well, I don't know how much you know about the history of uh, Holocaust remembrance in Israel, but it was very much depressed um, until the 60s and the Eichmann style. Um, before that, people wow. didn't want to hear about it. They were not very kind to the survivors because there was this Israeli ethos of being um, strong and not being a victim, and they were victims. Uh, so Israelis in general, until the Eichmann trial, did not approach it. There was just really not a, so those survivors had to suffer also another trauma um, in Israel. But then after they, the whole country heard the testimonies of in the Eichmann trial, the whole, the whole view changed and the whole attitude changed. And uh, as a child, I was brought up with a lot of information about the Holocaust. It's like every year you have the TV uh, is having all screening only things, I mean, films and discussions, and you have to read books, and, and you, you can't really escape it. Um, and of course, there are the museums that you go and as a child to visit, and now there is in Israel also visits to um, Auschwitz. Um, they are taking, and it's very problematic, but that's what it's then. So in one hand, there is no need, I think. But on the other hand, yes, there is a um, um, maybe if maybe they know they have more aware of what can be the the, um, the boundaries because they know more about it. Not sure that I answered your question, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I just that's what came to my mind when you. Jo crec que seria interessant donar la paraula al públic perquè ens queden... Ui, disculpa. Dic que donarem la paraula al públic perquè ens queden a penes... We'll give the floor to the audience because we have 10 minutes until 8 and I don't know if you have any quick comments or quick answers to the comments. It will be time to do it now. Mira, ya se animan. Hello. Hello. 
my name is Vicente. I'm from Chile, but I've been living here for two years. I'm a doctor, and I have Jewish roots. My grandparents migrated from Russia and Ukraine to Chile, beginning of the 20th century. So when I arrived here, I realized of several things which were related to the feeling of non-identification with my Jewish ancestors, because I think that Spain had a very important process of exile. Uh, this is part of the past. But what calls my attention here, and this is related to the last question that you ask, the interpretation of the works of art, is that it was a bit difficult here in Spain with the little experience I have. But uh, last weekend I was in Santander because my girlfriend is from Santander and we went to El Faro. And there is a column where you have a sign which says the pose. And there is no sign or infography or anything explaining why this column is there. It just says pause. And she told me that this is a place that plays, pays tribute to the Republicans that were killed during Franco. And I think that it's very important that the interpretation is in this sense when someone wants to remember historical memory. Because if you place me in s myself in front of a place that says pausa, I see the light, and I will think about the immensity of the sea without the context. So I don't know. What do you think as artist about this, about Spain, art in Spain, and remembrance and interpretation of art of a historical memory? I give you the floor because we would have to meet tomorrow again at this time. So just quick answers. I go back to some of the things I have said before. I think that the public space and we have to take a look at the objectives, what we are looking for. And I think that maybe uh, I was referring to conceptual art, and it's passionate. I think there are some processes that we reach just through art, which are frankly interesting. And these are some exercises of reflection from an intellectual perspective, which are very powerful. But when we go into the public space and when we are calling upon a uh, white audience if unless we have the tools to interpret these interventions. Well, I'm not saying to lower the level of complexity of the message, but I think it has to be hand in hand with providing the tools or facilitating the codes in order to be able to interpret it, because otherwise they are not fulfilling its function, or maybe it's not the place, the place where we have to intervene in such a way. It's my opinion. I think that we have to have the maximum of uh, discourses and depth of the debate, but there is a place where we have to go down, depending on the audience, the specific audience. Okay, I'm not artist and I'm not Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, um, yeah, um, but I kind of agree with uh, <laughs> what yeah. works. Sí. Buenas tardes, Good afternoon, Frederico Schaffer. I would like to ask you when we speak about art around memory. Um, remembrance, what I think very quickly are elements made by stone, iron, things that will remain. But here you are teaching us examples of very ephemeral art, street art, and maybe the following day is no longer there. How do we establish this relationship of remembrance with an ephemeral 
tools such as street art. Yo, yo. I think that, uh, as I was saying, that all paths from the content point of view have to be explored. I think that every support gives us uh, opportunities. And I think that it's interesting to do some research. The intrinsic uh, characteristics of uh, street art of this ephemeral component, I think that in a way is directly related to the public space, the space that we inhabit. It's life, and it's constantly changing, evolving. And in a way, I think it's nice. It's like this. These are cycles and moments. And we have the opportunities to revisit different subjects, thinking about them, or changing them, and rotating them. And I think that what could be an obstacle can become an added value. Does not exclude exploring other paths which are more permanent, and in a way consolidate also and endure in time. So this ephemeral component provides it with the capacity to be participative uh, and in a way are also subject to the past of time and covered by something new and life. And this is a public space and cities and villages become life spaces. Okay, I think it's a great question, really. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. I mean, this kind of the archaeology of urban life needs to be evolved and needs to be changed. If you want uh, there something to stay for, I don't know how long, then you have monuments. Um, we have them, okay, it's not like we don't have that as well. But I think the beauty, to be honest, that's my thing, but the beauty about street art is that it, 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 it's, it, it, it does not exist for life. It does not last. Um, and it is replaced by something else. Uh, I was once in Paris um, in a guided tour, a street art guided tour, an Israeli artist. And she was kind of describing us the life, I mean, all of them, it's a community. And they all know their space, kind of, where they can paint, and they don't really kind of <laughs> um, fight for space. But sometimes they do. Sometimes they try to. So, and, and it's almost like in life, there is something very vivid and 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 more like relate to us uh, when you approach art in this way. Um, so yes, it's not there. What I would do, by the way, I would doc document uh, the art, as I kind of did here. And I would, actually, I would urge the people in the academy or something to do more, because I don't think it's done enough. But um, yeah, I would document it, but I wouldn't expect it to be on the wall for, for, for eternity. I mean, that's not, that's not the concept. That's actually the opposite of what we we would like to have. Okay, so thank you very much. Final question, but you have to be very brief, please, because it's 8 o'clock. So we have to be very brief with the answer, please. Um, in any case, uh, not the work of street art, and Rock was uh, mentioning this not uh, with the street art, but the theme that we are approaching, um, uh, political and ideological, and it's important to value not only the context, but also to which point, and I don't want to open a huge debate, but just a quick answer, how the administrations, uh, they should participate of these interventions because there are affectations in the bar next to the statue. There was the picture of Franco and the context in which this statue is uh, placed also. It's finished, and there is an involvement and an intervention, political intervention um, in street art. Yes, it does exist, and it has happened also in some interventions where there was an agreement with the administration. 
and how to keep it. And just a comment, we always mention uh, street art related to the cities, but I think that we have to claim it in rural spaces, and I think that rural has intervened, rural has intervened there. Gracias. Thank you. Just a couple of comments to Beret, although it's not a question, although I would love to continue the debate with Rod also. Just a comment. The selection that you have made of the works of art, I think that most of them are reactive, reaction against uh, an action like, like anti-Semitism. So mm, they are uh, works of art that belong to this body of the Holocaust, but maybe it would not have happened as representation of the Holocaust without previously uh, an action, anti-Semitic action. And another comment, it's not a question, it's a comment. I think it's a work by Lacuna. Of course, we know all the qualities of uh, street art, immediate, uh, but art is not free of subjectivism. And I think that it was the work of Lacuna, the reproduction of the photography of deportation. I was very surprised. Maybe you can quickly tell us about the change of color of the star the from yellow to red. And memory and history, we extract a political element and semiotic element of exclusion. I don't know if you can say just a few comments to conclude. Um, related to Lacuna, uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, there is a very, very brief introduction, um, just like description of what he, the title and how he did it. And, and he has a site, and I was looking at his site, and there was no indication of why the color changed. But I'm planning to write him and ask. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, uh, but maybe it's also open for uh, what I feel. I was kind of conflicted. Um, I wasn't know if it's the blood uh, that he wants to, or some like I don't know flowers or something more positive like the red. I don't know what red represent. I really don't know. Maybe it's like part of okay. That's that's the iconography. We don't have to have a, a shared iconography. We, we, you have your own um, interpretation, and I might have in my interpretation. But that's that's the best I can reply uh, now about that. And I agree. They are all kind of response. I mean, once you decide to put a mural. <coughs> Um, yes, you you were kind of acting, uh, and you, you try to to say something. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you. I would like to comment on your comment, Chavi's comment, and often uh, when we speak about the administration, um, how the administration has interacted with some of my, of my works of art. Uh, one that I'm very interested in, which is very significant, and this is the Fia Valencia, about the freedom of expression. The quote of the ideas are not part of prison. They are debated. And this was a project that was very interesting because it was reactive of uh, political context of the moment, but the reaction came later because it was the opposite. It became a space of dialogue in which after a few weeks somebody went there and wrote something in Spanish, laws are to be fulfilled, and instead of erasing it or repair it, that painting was left there, and therefore that the space from a metaphorically point of view, went from a literary space to a space of confrontation of ideas. And therefore, when we speak about these limits, I think that the important thing is not to censor the limits. And if there are things that we don't like seeing, writing on the walls, we just have to fight this idea, not the fact that they are painted or not. So the objective is that uh, uh, this is not part of our dignity to leave it there. So if these interventions 
uh, create all the, and trigger all these dialogues. Welcome in a space uh, that can generate dialogues. Thank you very much. I leave it here. Non small way. Thank you very much. We leave the debate. Thank you, all of you, for being here today. Thank you, the technical team, uh, people of the model, translation, the support, people of the Urom. and the Israeli Institute of Budapest. Um, thank you for this afternoon. It was a pleasure sharing it with you.